Okay, so here's another layer of complication. We can look back to that origin that we called the origin of the Archaeplastida. So uh, under the endosymbiosis that gave us the chloroplast, here is a eukaryotic cell uh, basically consuming a cyanobacterium and rather than digesting that, leaving that inside of the body, uh, the cell body, and the cell that was free living goes on to become the chloroplast. So that became the ancestor to the Archaeplastida, and then they diversified into the glaucophytes, into the red algae, into the green algae. So that, fairly straightforward. <clears throat> However, there was benefit to be gained by other cells consuming not just a cyanobacterial cell, but now consuming one of these eukaryotic cells. So if you're a eukaryotic cell and you eat a photosynthetic eukaryotic cell, then you also take on the ability of photosynthesis. So it's this kind of major environmental advantage to basically learn how to do photosynthesis by eating something. And so it happened a few times. So if we have a eukaryote that consumes a photosynthetic eukaryote, uh, we call that a secondary endosymbiosis because the photosynthetic eukaryote already existed as a result of the primary endosymbiosis. So secondary and then even more. So like I said, this is a, an advantage to be gained multiple times and uh, lots of instances of organisms getting this ability. Uh, not a lot of them becoming major groups. So this is where this group or the, this classification sometimes we call protists uh, or a lot of our phytoplankton come around. So these are single-celled organisms in a lot of cases uh, that are put together in, in interesting ways. So you can see some, some wild variety of uh, sometimes multiple membranes surrounding the uh, cyanobacteria or the photosynthetic part of this cell, uh, sometimes multiple nuclei, different compartments, things like that. So uh, don't worry too much about these, just kind of be aware that it's possible for this to happen. But we do have groups that resulted from secondary endosymbiosis, and we kind of talk about how their chloroplast looks like a red algae chloroplast, or uh, say looks like has genetic similarity to a red algal chloroplast, or has genetic similarity to a green algal chloroplast. So for example, uh, this organism, has a green algae inside of it, basically. And this is uh, belonging to the group of euglenids. This one has a red algae inside of it, basically. And this is belonging to the dinoflagellates group. Okay, and I mentioned the heterocons here. This is the group that includes uh, diatoms and brown algae. So that's one that does show up as maybe a little more conspicuous, especially for the kelp, I think is one of our bigger uh, diatoms are major importance ecologically. Kelp has a major ecology uh, significance. And those are worth knowing, I think, maybe in that group there. All right, so pretty exciting. Um, lots, of, <laughs> lots of swapping around, uh, really for the reason that it's, it's a one-step ability to gain photosynthesis. Once you can do photosynthesis, then you can make food uh, with just light, water, and carbon dioxide. So big step up in the competition game. Okay, so just some images here, uh, groups you don't have to know, obviously. Uh, these are part of the phytoplankton. So I mentioned diatoms. These have like a crystalline shell. A lot of times have this kind of top bottom uh, arrangement of this crystalline shell on the outside. Uh, varieties of different organisms here. I won't get into detail on them. Uh, some of them have a little bit more almost like animal behavior. The euglenids, the cryptomonads uh, have uh, flagella that they can move themselves around with. Just, I don't know, kind of imagine the phytoplankton environment. There's a lot of single-celled organisms out there uh, and also a lot of competition, I imagine. Uh, so I'll skip over these, but you can maybe pull these up on your own time. Uh, videos about the euglenids. These are photosynthetic organisms that do a lot of swimming with their flagella, they've got this red eye spot that helps them to uh, orient in their environment. Uh, some examples of swimming green algae. Uh, there's a life, part of their life cycle called so-called zoospores. So 
basically spores with more of an animal characteristic. Uh, they got their name because they have flagella, they can swim around. So you don't typically think of your single celled green algae as swimming, but if you're a single cell in the environment, you probably want to swim around sometimes to get yourself out of harm's way or toward where the light is better for nutrients. Okay, so uh, we're going to talk in this class a whole bunch about land plants, but we're still hanging on just a little bit to the, the origins of land plants and this more global perspective on photosynthesis. So just keep in mind that there's a whole lot of photosynthesis happening in water bodies, uh, in the oceans. The oceans are most of the covered space on Earth, and they get a lot of light shining on them. They have abundant water. So they have the ingredients for photosynthesis, and sure, why not uh, have them able to do some photosynthesis? So these are uh, concentration of chlorophyll A in the oceans, um, not maybe as high, but higher in regions where nutrients are plentiful, where the conditions are right for them to get what they need for photosynthesis. And these are, you know, the primary producers. They're the base of the food chain for the, uh, the other part we call zooplankton, and then uh, just building up from there. So ocean fish all the way up to whales make use of the energy put in place by these tiny phytoplankton. Another reason we might care about phytoplankton is that their ancestors are the reason we have petroleum or uh, oil, the oil we get from the ground. So uh, we talked about coal before. Coal is basically the intact organs, the trunks of trees that used to be alive hundreds of millions of years ago. And what we have is petroleum are also kind of liquid bodies of old single-celled photosynthetic organisms. Uh, same thing with the other fossil fuels. This was energy put in place by photosynthesis, and then the bodies of these organisms were buried without decomposing, and uh, they got enriched for their carbon-containing molecules that we burn for fuel now. So our gasoline is a lot of old algae. Thanks, algae. Uh, this is a little bit of a, uh, I guess, more of a terrestrial view of where to get the oil in the world. So you might recognize on here some major oil-producing countries or regions of the world. Uh, these are places that are able to find oil in the uh, rocks underneath their respective countries. And another question might be when. So if you dig up and find uh, petroleum, what kinds of rocks do you need to find that in? So um, scientific or academic programs that teach you about geology, a lot of them are funded and produce uh, individuals that go out and have careers looking for petroleum, right? There's a lot of money in petroleum, uh, mining, I suppose, also. But if you know where and when, what kind of age of rocks to look for, to find your petroleum, then uh, that's a, a special skill to be able to locate where the petroleum is uh, in rocks that are buried in many cases far underground. So uh, I thought this was kind of interesting. So just about all of the petroleum we have uh, dates to this last 500 million years with big enrichment in the, uh, the, the period when the dinosaurs were around, Triassic, Jurassic, Cretaceous, 70% of the global petroleum produced during those ages. So if you want to find petroleum, you've got to find rocks of this age, uh, and also, I guess, the right conditions to have those organisms have been present there, and then you can locate your oil. Uh, this is a map maybe a little bit hard to see, but there are the continents today, and this is a world map that's shaded by the ages of rocks. I don't know, I just thought that <laughs> there's nothing here that you need to take home, but um, if you were looking for a particular age of rock, you would look for the same shading on here and try to zero in on that. I am not a petroleum scientist, so I'm going to not talk about this for very long. Okay, so then a little aside, right? What do we use petroleum for? This is, again, the bodies of old algae, uh, more or less. So old photosynthetic organisms, really old. And petroleum, uh, most commonly we think of it as the the resource that gives us gasoline, but it also gives us a whole bunch of other features. This is sort of a mix of hydrocarbons, so molecules that can be used to burn for energy. Uh, gasoline is one of them, petroleum or um, propane and other, other uh, resulting hydrocarbons from those. Um, 
not only fuels, but also this is the reason we have a lot of our plastics. Uh, a lot of chemistry goes into sort of the other parts of this that aren't maybe as easy to burn, can be used for other products, so styrofoam, plastics. Um, those are also resulting from, uh, they're, they're high in organic molecules and the source of those organic molecules would have been this petroleum. So uh, big resource, but uh, as they like to remind us these days, not a renewable resource. So when we're making use of any of these, uh, they're something that we won't necessarily have forever. So kind of a temporary, easy thing to use. Okay, so uh, we talked about primary endosymbiosis, secondary and so on endosymbiosis. And just to highlight also a little bit more about why this is beneficial, it's possible for organisms in their lifetime to take up uh, photosynthetic organisms and strike a partnership with them. So uh, it's not very common, but it does show up. So there are some multicellular organisms that uh, they have figured out how to partner with photosynthetic organisms. So on the left here, we have a sea slug. And again, it's green. It's green in this case because it has the ability to uh, eat photosynthetic organisms and have them end up in its tissues and they survive in there and they do a little trade-off where the uh, photosynthetic organisms can do photosynthesis uh, in exchange for same reasons we've seen before. So uh, they get a little bit of a partnership protection. Uh, maybe they get moved around to where the light is abundant. And the host organism, of course, gets the energy, the sugars and the, the chemical energy that's produced by photosynthesis. Uh, this is a sea anemone that has an endosymbiotic algae. So this one over here is the algae. This is the sea anemone green for a reason. It's doing photosynthesis. So there's still a benefit to be gained if somebody can figure out how to host a photosynthetic organism. Uh, lichens also related to photosynthesis and symbiosis. So um, we might mention these again when we get to the fungal section. We talk specifically about fungi but uh, I think this fits in nicely with endosymbiosis. So lichen, uh, they don't actually have the photosynthetic organism inside of the fungal tissue. Instead, they sort of wrap the fungus around the photosynthetic organisms, which can be uh, cyanobacteria or green algae. And they sort of make a, a tissue space for them to do photosynthesis and they trade off with the fungus for resources. So fungi are good at holding on to and obtaining uh, water and nutrients from their environment. And then they can provide those to the photosynthetic organism in exchange for some photosynthesis and sugar. So it's uh, instead of an endosymbiotic, endosymbiotic relationship, it's an ectosymbiotic relationship. So cells uh, next to each other, but not anybody inside of other cells. And of course, lichens not to be confused with lichens, which I don't think they have any photosynthesis. You never know. Uh, looking in a little more detail, this is a little more what I mean when I say ectosymbiosis. Uh, this is a lichen actually dispersing parts of itself to start new lichen uh, organisms or symbioses. So when it disperses, the cells are not explicitly inside of one another or anything like that. So the uh, algae cells go out sort of wrapped up in the fungal cells. So algae and fungi uh, bundle together into this dispersal packet and then they can blow somewhere and uh, get a new, a new lichen started. Um, this is kind of a, a fungal matrix inside with these little balls in here you can see would be the uh, photosynthetic organism. Pretty smart those fungi. Uh, we typically think of fungi in the lichen endosymbiosis, we think of it as one lichen hosting one uh, cyanobacterium or algae. And this is a recent study that just highlighted that it's possible for more than one, or sorry, more than two organisms to be arranged in this way. Uh, this was a couple different kinds of fungi, both together in this lichen arrangement. So. Life can get a little crazy sometimes. Uh, now we go back to the land plants. The land plants do have a single origin. 
And their origin is out of this group of Archaeplastida and specifically out of the green algae. So the land plants are, uh, you can think of them as a really highly modified lineage of green algae. So the green algae together are not all uh, what we call monophyletic. They're all descended from a common ancestor, but that common ancestor also gave rise to the land plants. Uh, this is another way to look at that. What this one has is a little guy at the center called ancestral green flagellate. How'd you like if that was your claim to fame? Ancestral green, green flagellate. So flagellate, a flagellated with flagella green algae cell. Uh, there was basically the original one. And it gave rise to all kinds of different living green algae. And of course, you don't have to know these also, but look at them go. And a specific group of these we've talked about before. We mentioned Cara, uh, this macro alga here, and some relatives would be the closest living algae, uh, green algae, to the land plants. But we do have just one origin of the land plants. And it's a little bit uncertain who exactly. Uh, was the ancestor of those land plants. So I think I'll stop here. I'll do one not too long video wrapping everything up in this next one.